Thanks for staying up later. Glenn Campbell is with us tonight, and of course, that suggests rhinestone cowboy and Galveston and Wichita lineman. And by the time I get to Phoenix and gentle on my mind and the variety show on CBS that was very popular. But if people think that's the whole story, they're in for a surprise because the roster of people you've played with, either on the road or in studio sessions, is staggering, including Elvis. So let's start there. When did you first come into contact with Elvis? In the late 50s, I was, in a, I was working at KOB in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We had a show called Noonday Roundup with the Dick Bills and the Sandia Mountain Boys. Fair and Young came, through, came in to the show. Elvis didn't come in because it was the Fair and Young show. They were to Armory in Albuquerque. And uh, it was a Fair and Young show featuring Elvis Presley. And uh, Fair and had went on last the first night of the tour. <laughs> and he said... From that day on, he went out and did his show, and then he introduced Elvis, and I could see why. And uh, it was very, very dynamic, Bob. Elvis came out with the three pieces and just floored me. You know, just him and the three pieces, the bass, drums, and guitar. And it was awesome. What was the difference between Elvis at what I would guess was his best, you know, late 50s, maybe into the early yeah. 60s? The difference between that and the Elvis that everyone parodies. If you, st if you see an Elvis impersonator, they're doing Elvis in Vegas in yeah. 1974. They're not right. doing the Elvis of 1958. No, they're not doing the old Elvis. Elvis was so dynamic then. I mean, his, just his voice carried everything. His, it was rhythm, his phrasing. Oh, yeah, I saw him in Vegas, too, in fact, in March of 77. Uh, and that was right before he died in August of that year, God rest his soul. And uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't the same Elvis I saw in, uh, naturally that I saw in uh, 56 or 7 in Albuquerque. And the whole show was different, you know. It was big time showbiz with a big band and giving the scarves away. But in the, it was very pure when I saw him in the late, in the late uh, 50s. How much of a sense of the power that he had over an audience did he have? It, it, was, it was awesome. Elvis Presley. I worked on uh, Viva Las Vegas, the soundtrack movie with him playing guitar. And uh, he could walk in a studio, and you could you could you knew he was in the room. Even if you if, if, even if you didn't know he came in the door, he had that much uh, charisma, that much magnetism. It was it was awesome. And he knew he had it. Yeah. Well, I don't. He knew he had it, but he was kind of shy about it. You know, it's uh, he, Elvis was a shy person. A lot of people don't know that. And everything he did on stage was never choreographed. Back then, it was all spontaneous. I think later on, it was more or less choreographed. Right, so you played with Presley. You also yeah. played on Sinatra's Strangers in the Night. Right. <laughs> it's a big hit in the mid-60s. Yeah, that was a thrill, I'll tell you. Uh, I, I'd always loved Sinatra. I, mean, I grew up with Sinatra because we had a battery radio when I was a kid. My dad did, and, and whatever came on, and in the 40s I was a kid, and that, and that was Sinatra's big era, actually. And I love Frank Sinatra, but to sit there and play on the session, we sat and ran the song for about, I guess, an hour, Strangers in the Night. And uh, Sinatra came in and did uh, about three, did three takes on it, I think. And scooby dooby doo and thanked everybody, and he was gone. And it was just <laughs> fascinating. See this capo? Yeah. That's what got me so much studio work. I'll show you what I did on Strangers in the Night, just for the heck of it. Now, okay. th you can play in sharp and flat keys. And uh, I was the last guitar on in. There was four acoustic guitars. Nobody knew, knew how to use a capo in L.A., but it was just, you know, strangers in the night, exchanging glances. You know, this is very strange, you singing this song this way to me and <laughs> making eye contact this way. And it's just, it's been a special we're, experience for we're me. We're in E flat, and you can't play it like that without a capo. And, and Ernie Freeman thought it was very unusual that I could play the ringing sounds and the minors and everything in sharp and flat keys, you know. It was, it was funny. I got a lot of studio work from Ernie doing that. You played on uh, You've Lost That Love and Feeling, The Righteous yeah. Brothers, and another, another Phil Spector uh, project, the Phil Spector Christmas album, which yeah. is still a classic. Oh, the work with The Righteous Brothers, they were so great. In fact, and later on, I, I, I went out as their opening act after uh, Gentle on My Mind came out. And it was great fun. I just go out with me and a guitar and do 15 or 20 minutes, and then they'd have a little in mostly colleges. Yeah. So, you know, all things considered, I'd say that you've lost that love and feeling, in my opinion, is one of the dozen or so best records of that era in rock and roll. It's a, a beautifully Definitely. orchestrated record. It's, it's got that, it, it was almost, I guess, 
the, the peak of Spectre's vision, where he yeah. made rock and roll sound like an opera. Right, definitely. He, you know, brought it all together and all the orchestration. Yes, I would say so. And uh, when uh, Hall and Oates came out with You've Lost That Love and Feeling, I played them side by side, and it was, there was quite a bit of difference there. Uh, that was, to me, probably the best record I played on, maybe with the exception of uh, Bridge Over Troubled Waters. Uh, those two hang real high on my list. Another feather in your cap is uh, Nat King Cole. Oh, yeah. Which song was that? It was uh, the album after Lazy, Hazy, Crazy Days of Summer. Nat always liked to warm up before he would uh, do the sessions. He'd sit and play piano. It was Ray Brown on bass, uh, Earl Palmer, I think, was drums. And I'd sit down on, I'd sit down on the get up next to Nat's piano stool and just play acoustic 12 string because that's what I was playing rhythm on the mm -hmm. sessions with. And it jammed, you know, and it was great. That was, it was a musician's camaraderie type of thing, like football players have a camaraderie, you know, that... Sure. It was, uh, so it was Nat. I looked at him more as a piano player, actually, but boy, you know, people don't realize how, what a great musician he was. I mean, boy, he was as good a jazz pianist as, you know, I mean, I put him up there with Earl Garner or Oscar Peterson or any of those guys. So you're actually able to be something of a chameleon. You're at home in all these different forms. You did a whole jazz treatment, an album of Dylan songs done in a jazz <laughs> style. I think Leon Russell was the keyboard right. man, right? I mean, people don't know this about you, that you can slip in and out of, of these various forms and that some of the top people in the business think enough of your work that they want you in their sessions. It was, it was great fun. It was like going to Juilliard for eight years. Only learning, you know, from in the course of a week, you'd play on Sinatra, you'd do Merle Haggard, you'd, you'd play with uh, Stephen Eady or Nat King Cole. It was just, it was just fabulous. I loved that. And that's, that really broadened my, uh, my whole attitude about music. Because when I left Albuquerque, I lived in Albuquerque, I got all the Django Reinhardt's old stuff, and I was going to be a jazz guitarist. That was it. I was going to mm -hmm. play a jazz man. But I realized there wasn't a whole lot of jazz in Albuquerque. And that's, I went to the West Coast to kind of seek that. And I ended up with the champs <laughs> on the road. Tequila. For eight, tequila for eight months, right. Uh, did you play on tequila? No, I didn't play on I played on Limbo Rock. <laughs> and I'm glad I never played on another one of those. Would that be Jack be nimble, Jack be quick, Jack go under Limbo Stick? <laughs> right. Same thing. Billy Strange wrote it. I, I, I never got so sick of playing something all my life. <laughs> Every Limbo boy... Right, Every limbo boy, get yourself a limbo girl. Yeah. Give that chick a limbo world. World, yeah. That was Chubby Checker's record of that. We had, a, we had. You know, I'm ashamed that I know this. <laughs> <laughs> it shows where your head was. Bob. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> but the uh, that was it was a time period. There was some great talent in the group, uh, especially with uh, Jimmy Seals and Dash Cross. Dash was playing drums, and Jimmy was playing sax and fiddle, in the Champs. Yeah. And uh, they Seals and Cross later and. I was happy to see him do that. With all this background, and it's so varied, did you ever feel uncomfortable with what became your image? Because after all, when you do something on television, so many people see it, it supersedes everything else. Mm -hmm. And so That's people true. then would pigeonhole. This is what this guy did. He sings songs like By the Time I Get to Phoenix and Wichita mm -hmm. Lyman, and he's an affable guy on television, and they didn't know this other stuff about you. Right. I, it's, it's sad that music is, is put in cubby holes, you know. This is, this is country, this is contemporary country, this is uh, conservative country, it's, or pop or rock or whatever. It really is sad. And I know I'm not, I'm not mad about it. I'm happy to be here, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> the show in the 60s, TV show called Shindig. And this was so strange. I remember it uh, as a kid in that this was a weird meeting place between like the old and the new. The Rolling Stones would be on the show, Chuck Berry would be on the show, and then Zsa Zsa would be on the show, mm -hmm. or Mickey Rooney. It was just weird. <laughs> was do, do I remember this right? <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> oh, I'm really good enough to be dead. I'll never forget, the, the Supremes were on that show. Uh, that's where I first met Diana Ross, and oh, what a great gal. But I was, going back to the, to the music, you know, like I'd play on every kind of different set. I was a, a utility singer on the show and guitar player. I'll never forget I did Kansas City Star one week, and the next, Roger Miller's thing. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, they dressed me up in a 10-gallon hat and sheepskin clothes. They made everything try to fit. 
And the next week, I did I'm Alive by the Animals. <laughs> and I'd do a Sinatra bit, you know. And it was really strange. I see yeah, Eric I Burden and it. Roger Miller as pretty much interchangeable myself. Oh, me but... too, the animals. <laughs> Roger, Roger is funny. Roger said he said I gave him a right arm to be ambidextrous. <laughs> oh, is that his, Miller. that's his line? That's Roger's line. I've used that myself and tried to pass it off as my own idea, so <laughs> <laughs> I know who I can give the credit to. Oh. Weren't Billy Preston, yourself, and Leon Russell were sort of like the house band? Mm -hmm. For sure. David Gates played bass on it, too. It's more widely known that you toured for a while with the Beach Boys, taking Brian Wilson's place, mm -hmm. right? First time Brian got uh, sick. They called me on Thursday and said, Glenn, can you go to Dallas with us Saturday night? I said, and do what? And they said, play bass and sing Brian's part. Now, that was Thursday, and the gig was Saturday. And I said, I don't know the words. They said, well, we'll teach them. We'll teach you. I said, I know the part. I can do the part. That's no problem because I'd played on the sessions. And I knew most of the songs. I'm, you know, m instrumentally I knew them. But mm -hmm. they wanted me to play bass. And I had played bass before. I'd went on a tour with Rick Nelson in Japan playing bass and singing harmony with him. And I said, I can handle the bass part. But I didn't realize it was like, you know, patting your head and rubbing your stomach playing bass <laughs> and singing the high part, you know. It's a little old lady from Pasadena. And you're... It was madness. But it worked out great, you know. I just kind of just did the part, you know, and it worked out fine. And maybe within a couple of weeks, I had all the lyrics down pretty well because it wasn't any of it really too intricate until they did the Pet Sounds album, you know. That's mm -hmm. when they started doing the good, the heavy stuff. And it was great, man. I enjoyed it. Did you play on the recording of Good Vibrations? Did somebody mm -hmm. tell me that? Yeah. yeah you, you could make a good case that that's... That's the transition record, at least among Definitely. those that are that were a big hit. That's the transition for uh, for Wilson and for the Beach Boys. I think so. Definitely, that that's a great album, Pet Sounds. Uh, uh, I played on actually four different single records of Good Vibrations. I remember we were down in Gold Star, which is uh, it's not there anymore. Well, Gold Star Recording Studios when he was putting the. It was all done separate, and some of it, were done, it was done over at United and uh, Western Recording Studios. And just sitting there playing 12-string rhythm guitar. That I would really go. What do you think happens today if somebody writes a song as good with the same kind of sound as By the Time I Get to Phoenix or uh, Gentle on My Mind, and you recorded it? Is there any place to take it now? Could it become a hit, or is radio too fragmented and people's tastes now too different? I just think radio's too fragmented. The people's tastes haven't changed. Good, good songs and good music will be, but it, it, it would still be Cubby Holt. You know, you, if you call it, like, I was on the pop charts and the country charts and the MOR charts. Uh, at one time, I was looking at Billboard or Cashbox. I had ten, eight albums in the top ten in the country charts and five albums in the top ten in the pop charts. And that was because of television. Mm -hmm. And they played me on country, M.O.R., rock and roll. And I didn't have my first number one record in all three categories until Rhinestone Cowboy. Which of yours would you say, all right, they want a time capsule. They want me to put two or three in. Glenn Campbell's standards best represent my work. What would you put in? Oh, I don't know, Rhinestone Cowboy or Southern Nights or Wichita Lineman, maybe. Rhinestone Cowboy is my philosophy song. I heard that on the radio and just I almost wrecked my car. Uh, I mean, it was just, you know, I mean, the whole, the sound of the record and everything was, you know, I, I could tell all the elements were there, but I didn't think it was quite put together. No offense, Larry. Larry Weiss wrote it, and it was his record I heard. Uh -huh. But I carried that with me for about a month and a half, two months. I was on was a tour of Australia. So all I played was Rhinestone Cowboy. Because there's been a load of compromising on the road to my horizon. Now, this was through the, you know, that would have been from 68 to 74. And boy, there had. I met with a TV, with managers, with agents, with you name it. And his, the second verse says, there will be a load of compromising on the road to my horizon, but I want to be where the light is shining on me. I just thought that just blew me away, you know, and no ever crack in the dirty sidewalks of Broadway, which yeah. I, I did, you know. That was, so that's, I think that's a, a timeless song. Don't you know? What I get from you is uh, a certain confidence, a certain self-assurance as you sit here, you're not striving to be hip. What my, my guess would be, you figure whoever needs to know knows what you did. Yeah, and and that, that, that had a certain badge of hipness to it. 
And if most people know the television show, which was popular for different reasons, you're happy with the whole thing. Yeah, that's true. I did a music show on NBC, which a uh, friend of mine, John Pike, he's the head of Paramount Television now. He was a vice president of NBC, and he was all going home on his music show, right in the middle of it, right in the middle of the second day shooting. We'd done three shows and three shows, 30-minute music show, supposed to be Saturday Night Access, you know. He quit. Or he got, uh -huh. he got offered the job at, at Paramount, and it went right in the tank. So we did 20, maybe 26 shows. And it was aired at, uh, what is Prime Access, 6.30 to 7? In, yeah, in the East, yeah. But anyway, I got more comments on that show because I just got to do any kind of music, and I'd have one guest on. It was a 30-minute show. And, uh, but it's, that's there. Uh, and people in the business would say, Come up, I like that, Glenn. It's according to who you're talking to whether it makes any difference or not to me, to me. Like when somebody comes up and I know they know what they're talking about, it, yeah, I say, well, thank you. That gives me encouragement. When you perform now, what's your audience like, age-wise, demographically, and what do they want to hear? They want to hear Glenn Campbell be Glenn Campbell and sing what Glenn Campbell sings. Uh, I'm, I have, my stuff is still played on, on country and the MOR stations all the easy listening stations, and they expect me to do those, and which I do. I'm so fortunate to have songs that, uh, like, like Gentle on My Mind. I love to sing Gentle on My Mind. I love to say those words. I love to do By the Time I Get to Phoenix. Jimmy Webb's songs are so melodically great. The melody is so good. The chord progression is so good. And Jimmy Webb, is, I think, is the best musical poet ever to be born and raised in America. But you say to me, Bob, where were all those clips from Glenn's TV show? Where are all these stories about the Smothers Brothers? What about True Grit? And I say to you, if you can stay up this late tomorrow night, that's when you'll get it, because Glenn Campbell will be back. See you later.